going to jump into God's word here this morning in the book of Acts, but um, before we do that, um, I want to I want to just acknowledge uh, the obvious. And as you all probably know, um, our church family has has uh, lost uh, a dear member of the family. And uh, man, I didn't I was not going to cry. <clears throat> so much for your plans, right? Um, so that dude there, right? Um, so he, he, um, he is no longer here with us, but all that Jay believed <clears throat> and all that he taught us, he now gets to enjoy. And so that's really, really cool. So, um, you know, sad that he's not here. He's like a dad, and Marty's a mom, and I literally call her mama. And uh, I'm sure that she'll be back here with us soon. She's probably watching me being a crying, whimpering baby right now <clears throat> on her phone, so... Love you, Mama. Um, we, uh, it was quick. So um, five days ago, he went to the hospital, and now he's gone. <clears throat> and uh, didn't realize that he had cancer. He's a tough dude, man. And uh, he's been walking around with, with cancer for years and didn't even know it. And up here faithfully serving the Lord, serving you uh, with stage four cancer. <clears throat> and uh, ride motorcycles, dirt bike racing up till just a few years ago. That's a tough dude right there. And uh, not only was he a faithful servant of the Lord, that if he had healed, he would have been here again for sure. Um, and he let me know that. But what an awesome example of a husband, right? Just um, Just uh, just loving uh, what he would say is my Marty for 50 years. He wouldn't even let her come to a study here alone. He was going to be by his side to protect her no matter what. And when he was going in for his surgery, which was the last time he spoke, the last thing he would say to his doctors is, make sure you keep my Marty well informed. So uh, just super grateful that I had the opportunity to, to serve alongside of him these last couple of years and uh, all those years in ministry. And he was... Great to talk with and lots of experience, been walking with the Lord faithfully for a long time. So super blessed that uh, the Lord led him here into these doors about three years ago so we could, man, I'm just gross, I got snot everywhere. And uh, so anyway, so there's that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but not just uh, not just Jay, you know. So just this morning, found out that Christina lost one of her best friends yesterday. And then Herb comes in this morning, and I guess his uncle passed away yesterday. So they're on their way to be with Herb's mom because she's just a mess, of course. And she just lost her husband last week. So all of this, just a, a real uh, heavy, heavy time course and uh, in our family so uh, you know I think the word of God can can revive the soul and bring joy to the heart and so we need that more than ever and so um, we're going to jump in and do that and, and really um, I just want to honor Jay this morning especially because he absolutely loved the word of God I mean, that man studied and studied and studied and um, I guess Lisa's not here with us this morning, but Lisa was given the, the uh, opportunity to take Jay's notes and continue their Sunday afternoon Bible study for a couple uh, months, actually, after he stopped doing it. And she has his notes, and I think that's just a treasure to keep. He loved to study the Word of God. Um, <laughs> he loved to study what I said and let me know when he disagreed with it, and that's cool. <clears throat> and... Uh, 
and I welcomed that, and we didn't always see eye to eye, but he never, ever, ever, I don't think he ever gave me his opinion because he knew that his opinion meant nothing. He came and he brought a chapter and a verse and a chapter and a verse, and we would hash it out and reason together, and I respect that man for that. And, um, and so I just want to take this morning to let God's word to just revive your soul and bring joy to your heart in a time of heaviness. Um, before we do, I, I would just like to ask that maybe you just take a moment with me and, and just talk to the Lord about all this loss and, and the great need that comes along with it that everybody has right now. And, and you know, I wish I could, I wish I could comfort you and, and help you and, and all that, but, you know, I got nothing. You know that. And that's God's job. He's the comforter. And so, um, why don't we just ask him to do, to do what we cannot do, but what our, um, our loved ones desperately need. So, um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, we, we love you, and we acknowledge you now. Um, as we sung earlier, um, death no longer has its grip on us, Amen. and the king is alive. And, and so, because of that, um, we can face these losses with singing. And although we have tears, and that's okay and normal because we're, 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 we're like you now. <laughs> we, we love, and, and so that's why it hurts to, to lose loved ones, uh, you know. And so, you know, comfort us now, you know, while we're grieving and, and suffering loss. But really there's no loss um, for those that know Christ. And we, we know that, Lord. And so... Um, for those that are really struggling, I think of Christina, and I think of Marty, and I think of Herb and Jen, and I know that when someone close passes, there's just great pain and loss, but help us this morning to remember afresh the gospel, the gospel that tells us that even though we die, we live, and um, eternity is rushing upon all of us, even right now, and so grateful for those of us that have embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior so we don't have to fear death, that it's just, death is just another step, um, and, and it's just a part of our life, and there's a, there's a heaven awaiting us, yeah. and there's no more sorrow and no more pain and no more tears and no more sickness and no more death. And so we rejoice with the saints that have gone and are enjoying what we long to enjoy. And so help us this morning as we study your gospel to be refreshed. Let all that the gospel is rush upon our mind and heart right now so we could find peace. That's what we need. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would open up our, the eyes of our heart to see truth, to recognize truth, to recognize maybe where we're not in line with it. And I would just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be moldable, to be flexible, to allow you to speak to us and to change. And so, Lord, as I bring your word the best way that I can, I pray that you would, like, weld it weld, like brand it, brand the truth to our lives right now so we could hear it and embrace it and live it and never let it go. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, amen. 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 All right. So why don't, we, uh, <clears throat> why don't we open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 15, all right? Grab a Bible. Don't sit and look at me. I'm not the Bible. Grab a Bible. There's Bibles on chairs. There's Bibles on pews. Who needs a Bible? Who doesn't have a Bible in their hand? I'm going to bring you one. Come on. You, got, you need one right there, right? Look at that. Here's one right here. <clears throat> Who else needs a Bible? Anybody? You need a Bible? Awesome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Anybody? Anyone? 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 Bueller? Bueller? All right. Awesome. Everyone? Everyone's at Acts 15, right? Yeah. So while you're turning there, <clears throat> just want to say that the book of Acts is, is really the story, it's the narrative of Christ expanding his church, right? Remember the last time I got up and I got to share with you, and, and 
Uh, took a little break from that because our brother Carl was up here last week and did a great job talking about God's love for us. And <clears throat> I just thank his faithful and thank you for your faithfulness, Carl, and willingness to get up and share what God's laid in your heart. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, but last time we talked here about the book of Acts, we talked about how the baton had kind of been passed on to us, right? The God was in Christ reconciling people back to himself. And now he has given us, say us, us. right? Are you a believer? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And then that means it's, it's you he's talking about right there. So let's just change it a little bit, right? I think we can take the, the liberty of changing God's word to say this. He has given me, say me, me. he's given me this task of reconciling people to him. We are Christ's ambassadors, right? And so we see all that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So what we see in, before the, the, the book of Acts is written and, and all the stuff that happens there, we see that in the Gospels we see Jesus doing this and doing that and teaching and preparing his people for his death and burial and resurrection. And he is, right, the, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God in Christ, and he's going around and he's teaching and praying and, and healing and, and he's advancing his kingdom, right? And he's preparing us to do that right now. And so as he gets ready for his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension to heaven, uh, he's preparing us. He's preparing his disciples. And then in Acts, we see that his disciples are now doing as Jesus did and as Jesus taught, right? That's what we see in the book of Acts. And so Jesus would say, I believe it's in John 17, as you have sent me, now I send them. So Jesus was doing it while he was here on earth. Then he ascends to heaven and he says, here, here's the baton, man. Now it's up to you to go do it. And so that's our job, okay? That's your job. Say, that's my job. Come on, more than Ricky. Anybody else think that that's their job? That's my job, right? And so that's exactly why we study the book of Acts, right? We study the book of Acts so, because the baton is in your hand. And we want to look at the runners who came before us to see how it should be done. How do we advance this kingdom? What do we do with this baton that's now in my hand and I'm supposed to run with it? What am I supposed to do? And so we see that in the book of Acts and that's why we study it. We do what they did. So we see the latest how-to tutorial, if you will, in Acts chapter 15 on how to get it done. Now, leading up to Acts chapter 15, because context is everything, right? Location, location, location. That means we study what was before it, we study what it is, and we study what's after it to understand what's really going on there. So what's going on prior to Acts chapter 15 is super, super important. So we see uh, Peter and Paul and Barnabas and all those guys, they're just simply doing this. No matter where they go, no matter what they're doing, they're doing one thing consistently. What is that? They're sharing the gospel, right? They're sharing the gospel with people, Jews, Gentiles now. Everyone that they encounter, they're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see some results of that. Acts chapter 11, verse 21. A large number of Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Acts chapter 12, verse 24. The word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. Acts chapter 13, verses 48 and 49. When the Gentiles heard, they were glad. Were you glad when you heard the gospel? Yeah. I was super glad when I heard the gospel. I was starting to wonder when I heard the gospel, why has it been 32 years since somebody told me this? Right. What's wrong with you people? Right? Here's a Jewish, a white Jewish dude growing up in a suburb of America, and it took 30 plus years to hear the gospel? What's wrong with you people, right? right. Something's yeah. wrong. Something. Something's way wrong, right? Okay, so, so here, when the Gentiles heard, they were glad, and they thanked the Lord for his message, and all who were chosen for eternal life became believers, so the Lord's message spread throughout the region. Acts 14.1, a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. So good things are happening, right? But as we noticed last time we preached in the book of Acts, every time that there's a push forward, what is there? Push back. A push back, right? There's a push back. So, so look at here it comes again, right? Here it comes again, Acts chapter 15. It should be the same exact thing. Every time this pushed forward, you saw the results of what happened there. The preaching the gospel, people are getting saved like crazy. But when people are getting saved like crazy, here, here it comes again, right? Here it comes again. And this time it doesn't come in the form of be quiet. And it doesn't come in the form of, hey, just stop that. Now it comes a little different. It's just a little detour. Just a little detour, just a little distraction, right? The enemy's always up to something, right? What's next? What's next? What's next? Sometimes it's blatant in your face. Hey, shut your mouth. 
Keep that for church, right? Keep your preaching for Sunday morning. And sometimes it's just like, hey, just that's enough, man. I don't want to hear that stuff. And just quit what you're doing. And then sometimes it's like, no, no, that's cool what you're doing, but, you know, here's just a little tweak, 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 tweak. Isn't that what the devil did at the beginning? Tweak, tweak, tweak. So look at Acts chapter 15, right? Look at Acts chapter 15. Let's just read. The, let's just start reading right there, right? Your eyes are on it? Okay. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, it just seems to be their place to hang out. Northern Israel, all the way up at the top, there's a city, Antioch. And he just, that was his base. He was there, he's out. He was there, he was out. He'd go back there, he'd go back out again. Paul loved it there. And it was just like a, a, meeting, a meeting place. It was, a, it was a, a center of commerce. It was a busy city. And when you got there, you can go south to Jerusalem. You can go, you can go to the right, to the, to, the, to the Orient, and you can go left towards Europe. I mean, it was just a great spot to get to every place in that area, on that continent. And so that's where he was. So Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria. Some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. I don't like that word, right? I don't like the word believers, really. That's not what it's supposed to be. What does it actually say at the bottom of my Bible? There's a star there, right? And it says disciple, right? He started teaching disciples. There were some disciples, right? There were some, they, were, they started to teach the disciples. These are people that are what? They're Christians, they bent the knee to Jesus. They're Christians already, right? They're not just believers, right? You know that the, that the devils believe, right? The, 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 the Satan's little homeboys, they believe that Jesus is the Lord, but they refuse to obey him willingly. It's not what they want. They don't like him, right? But they believe, right? So it's a weak word to say that they start teaching some of the believers. No, they started teaching some of the disciples. The one, Are you a disciple of Jesus? Not just believe in Jesus, but are you disciple means you're a student, you're a follower, you're an emulator, right? You're dying, he's increasing. That's what a disciple is. Is that who you are? And so they start teaching the disciples. You'd think they'd be set in stone. A disciple hears Jesus' voice and follows him. But sometimes you get a little distracted because other voices sound like the, like the voice of the Savior, but they're really not, and you've got to be careful. That's why we study the Word, so we understand what he's actually saying. So these disciples are being taught something from some men from Judea. Judea is the area that contains Jerusalem. This is the main, this is, this is like, um, we're not Roman Catholic, but the, the Roman Catholic Church, like where's their, where's their home base? Right there at the Vatican, right? So in a sense, like Jerusalem was kind of like the Vatican. Like that was the, that was the place where the church had started. Like right? this is central, this is Central Park, this is, this is, this is, this is home base for the church. They've come from the home base, and they're teaching disciples this. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so Paul and Barnabas, they're, they're disagreeing with them, of course, and they're starting to argue with them and, and say, no, 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 that's not the way it is. And so the church there decides, listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we go to the source? Let's figure out what the gospel really is, because if we're going to spread the gospel, we want to spread the right gospel, right? Do you want to spread the wrong gospel? So I could grab a basketball out back right now out of that basketball thing there, and I could walk around with this basketball, and I could shoot hoops. And if I was shooting hoops while I was carrying this basketball, what sport was I playing? No, I'm not. not here. No, because basketball means you bounce. Right, you bounce the ball, right? So carrying around a basketball like a football and shooting it, that's not basketball. You don't want to say that it's basketball when it's not basketball, and you don't want to say that it's the gospel and advance a gospel that's not the gospel at all. And we have to be careful of that, okay? And so they're arguing with them, and they send, so they send Paul and Barnabas with some other folks of the church just for credibility and accountability. And they, because, you know, listen, teachers can, 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 st can, can hold their ground and believe something so strong. And so they might twist it a little bit, right? And so they have to send somebody. Even Paul and Barnabas have someone that has to go with them just to make sure that they're keeping it honest, right? So the church sends some people accompanied with, with Paul and Barnabas, some local believers, some local disciples, to talk to the apostles and the elders about this question. They're like, do, do we really need to do this to be saved? And so the church sends the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way, and they encouraged the, the other believers along the way. And then they get to the church, and when they're there at the church, what happens? The church all gets together. The apostles and the elders are all there. Verse 4, verse 5, 
some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees, right? They stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must, so here we are again, here they are. So I think, now I don't know if this is the gospel or not, but I think just from reading that, I'm thinking that the people that showed up at Antioch from Jerusalem were probably part of this group because this group stood up and said the same exact thing, right? So I'm thinking that these guys that came to Antioch and started teaching that you have to be circumcised to be saved are probably part of that same group, okay? So you have to be circumcised to be saved. So here's the deal with circumcision in case you are not aware, and we're not going to use props or anything or pictures this morning, but, you know, yeah, so, 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 Jewish boys that were born uh, on the eighth day, I believe it was, they would circumcise. So they would chop off the foreskin off of their penis. And that was the, that was the identification mark, a physical identification mark, that that kid was a Hebrew. Okay, that's what it was. It was God's mark. He said, this is what I want you to do to show that you're mine. And so what these guys are saying is, listen, before you become a Christian, before you follow Jesus, you have to become Jewish. That's what they're saying. You have to become Jewish, Gentile. Listen, there's, there's, there's Hebrews like my, I'm, I'm Hebrew, I'm Jewish, right? And then there's the rest of you. And no matter where you're from, if you're not Hebrew, if you're not Jewish, then you ain't Jewish, right? You're, you're something else. You're Gentiles. That's just the, the summary term for every other person on earth, okay? So the Gentiles, they're saying, listen, if you want to worship our God, you have to become one of us to be with him. And God's like, wait a minute, I'm the only God in all of the universe for real, right? The other ones are just clay and rock and wood, and they're dead. They can't do anything. He's the only God. And if he's the only God, then that means every single human should worship him, right? He's not, his desire is not a single one would perish, but that all would come to repentance, right? He's the only God, so everyone should worship him. So it doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not. I'm God, whether you're Jewish or not. Right, So I want you to follow me. I want you to bow to me. I want you to obey me. Right, so, But they're saying, listen, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. Well, here's the problem with that. The apostles knew the gospel. Right, They'd hung out with Jesus. They knew the gospel. And Paul says this in Galatians 1.8. Let God's curse fall on anyone, like not just a person, right? not just you or me, Watch this. Or even an angel from heaven. Right? So there's God, right? Then there's these angelic beings that we're all like, whoa, like incredible. They show up and everyone's like on their face scared, right? Like huge, powerful things that we can't even describe with words. And they're God's messengers and they're God's army and they're mighty. And even them. Let God's curse fall upon even them if they preach a different gospel other than the ones that other than the one that we preached. Right? So the apostles knew the gospel. As a matter of fact, like Paul, he kept it simple when he went to Corinth. You know what he said? He goes, Hey, you know what? When I came there, this is what I preached to you. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. That's the gospel in a nutshell, right? That's the gospel. Listen, this is the way you get saved. Jesus, right there. Say yes to it. Yeah. Boom! That's it. That's how you get saved, right? Like I understand that there's more and there's more that we can do in response to that. But at the end of the day, that's the gospel. You're broken. He's not. He did that. You say yes. yes. That's it. That's the gospel. It's super, super simple, but that's what it is. And so listen, here's the point of the day. We never, how many people want to advance the gospel here? You want to? Right? We never compromise the gospel in order to advance it. Never, never, rev, never, right? Churches do it. Preachers do it. I may have done it on occasion. I don't know if I did or not. If I do, you call me to the mat and tell me where I was wrong. But that, that's what happens. Listen, we never compromise. Never, ever. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what year it is, what country you live in. The gospel is the gospel, and it does not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord. I do not change, right? And that's it. And so we don't change the gospel. We don't add anything to it like they're doing. We don't take anything away from it to make it more palatable. Listen, it's not palatable. Okay? The gospel is ugly and gritty and terrible in a sense. What God sends his only son to die. His, his good plan was to crush him for you. That's, what's good about that? We're, it's good because we're recipients. But how awesome, if you're a parent, is that awesome news? 
It's not. It's not palatable. And, it's, and it doesn't need anyone's improvement. It, it doesn't need your spices off your rack to make it more appetizing. It's beautiful in the, in the way that it's been presented by the apostles. And it doesn't need any help. So listen, what I want to do this morning, I want to show you there's a massive difference. This is where these guys are confused. There's a massive difference between what you do to be saved versus what a saved one does. There's a massive difference between that, and I think what they're, that's the problem here with these guys, these Pharisees. They think that there's certain things you have to do to get saved, and what the apostles would teach you is that, no, there's one thing you got to do to get saved. I just told you what it was. But now that you're saved, there's some things that you ought to do, okay? And that's the problem. So what we see here in Acts chapter 15, we see these men from Judea, right? We see these men that are part of the sect of Pharisees. These were the law keepers, the law memorizers. They knew the, the first five books of the Bible. Listen, do you guys do any Bible memorizing? Right? Who knows a Bible verse by heart? Raise your hand. What is it? Say it. Okay. <laughs> what is it? Pray continue. What else? Anybody else have one? Who has a verse? That was almost a bomb. What else? Wait, wait, what's the verse? What's the verse? Amen. What's that? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Go ahead. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> you're so awesome. Amen. <laughs> Where is it? Say the reference. Yeah, what's the reference? Do you know? Slacker. What else? Wait, you already had one. What else? I love you, brother. Let's hear it loud and proud. Go ahead. What is it? Do not forsake the assembly. Amen. Amen. I didn't pray him to say that. Okay, that was awesome. I hope you got that online. Go ahead. Out of love for you, I want to tell you that that is an awesome prayer. It's just not a Bible verse, but it's good. It's okay. I love you, and I, I want you to, but I want, I want to, I, listen, the reason why I'm saying that is not to shame you, but I want to elevate the value of God's word above all things, okay? And so God's word, precious and perfect. Okay, so listen, you know what these Pharisees did? Now, they didn't know a verse or two. They memor, oh, look at your Bible, right? Look at your Bible, and go to, go to the end of, go to the beginning of Joshua, right? Okay, and then I want you to look at the beginning of Joshua, right? And I want you to look to the left of it. See all those pages? They had that memorized. Right? We're struggling to get a verse out of our face. These guys had that memorized, right? And all those crazy laws that we read in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all that, they did them perfectly. They didn't even break the rules, right? They did all that and had it memorized and still not getting it right, okay? These guys, the, here, here's the reason I'm saying, I'm telling you this. There are people that are wolves, okay? There are wolves in the church. And I think that there are people that are, are false teachers, but it's not because, like, okay, some of them are, are, are absolute card-carrying members of hell, and Satan sent them to the church to wreck it. I get that, right? I get that. But I like to believe for greater things concerning all people, because I don't know their heart. And so I like to look at people with a greater view than that, and, and just assume that, and I'm going to assume that of these people, that these people are good-intentioned Christians that are just wrong, okay? And all of us are like that. Can you admit that you're wrong sometimes? I am. Right? I'm the guy with the microphone. I have been wrong. I probably will be a little wrong today, maybe in some things, right? Because I'm not God. I'll be wrong again. We have to have some humility when we're, when we're walking up to God's word because it's perfect and you're not. And these guys are good intentioned, I believe, Christian leaders that were just simply teaching something wrong about salvation. And this happens today as well in the church. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But first, let's let, let's let God's word help us to understand the difference between doing something to be saved versus what saved people 
do. Okay? So in our Acts 15 text, we see uh, that the religious leaders, they're insisting on circumcision to be saved, right? Now, that's what they said you needed to do to be saved. You know, I like it way down there, way better than up here. I, don't, I've, I used to be down on the floor all the time, and I got up here a couple years ago. I hate it. I've always hated it. So here I am again. Okay? I like to be down here with you guys, right? I feel like that's like, I hate it up there. Okay? Um, so, so we see that there's a difference now between what these guys think, and I think their, inten their intentions were probably good, and I think that most preachers and teachers that you may see on TV and magazines and all that stuff, probably there's some that I think are just like way out of their minds, right? That's preach some stuff that's so off the wall it's crazy. But I don't know their heart, right? And we're not to judge another master's servant, so I'm not going to say anything about some of these people that I think are just way out of here. But I would just want to believe that they have good intentions. They've read the same Bible I'd have, and this is what they just see. And maybe they're right, and maybe they're wrong, and I don't really know. But I think that these guys are probably a little bit off, these guys from the Pharisees. They think you've got to be circumcised, and they think you have to keep all the laws and all that to be a Christian. Well, here's the difference between them and what Paul would say about circumcision. Look in your Bible at the next chapter. Look at verse uh, chapter 16. You see it there in front of you? Here's the difference between what those guys thought about circumcision and what Paul would say, an apostle of Christ who absolutely knows the gospel. Watch this. Paul went first to Derby, and then to Lystra where there was a young disciple. You see it there? He's already a believer. There's a young disciple there. and What's his name? Timothy, right? He's a famous guy in the Bible. And, and everybody should have a Paul in their life who's speaking life into them. Right? And, and everyone should have a Timothy that you speak life into. That's disciples making disciples. That's what we're supposed to be getting after here at this church. And I call you all into that process of having a Paul and having a Timothy in your life. Okay? And so he goes to, to Derby and Lystra where there's a young disciple named Timothy. And Timothy's mother was a Jewish believer. Okay? She was a Jewish believer. So she was, a, she was also a follower, but she was Jewish. That's awesome. And I rejoice in the fact that I'm Jewish and that I actually had my eyes open to the reality of my sin problem and my need for the Messiah and that the Messiah actually is Jesus, not some dude that's coming sometime, but he already has. And I received that, and these people already did that as well, and so I rejoice in that. And one of these days, the Bible says that all of Israel will, will bow to Jesus Christ. I look forward to that day, too. And Timothy was well thought, oh, I'm sorry, his mother was Jewish, but his father was a Greek. His father was a Greek. So you got a Jew and you got a Gentile. But it doesn't say anything about the father believing. It just says him and the mother were believers. But maybe the dad, maybe not. I think that if he was, the Bible would have said it, but we don't know. And so we leave it in the I don't know column. Timothy was well thought of by the believers. Uh, what's that say? Uh, brothers. Brothers. By the brothers. You know, in New Testament context, anytime you see the word brother, it's not about your natural brother. Most often it's about your brother, right? It means you're, we're brothers. Hey, brother. What's up, man? How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. That's my brother in Christ, right? There's a very tight relationship between brothers and brothers and brothers and sisters, right, in Christ. That's what he's talking about. And so we see here that, that uh, Timothy was a, a believer. His mother was a believer. His dad, maybe. Timothy was well thought of by all the brothers, all the disciples, all the followers of Jesus Christ in Lystra and Iconium. Those are cities you can check them out on your map at the back of the Bible. You can, I hope you have your maps. And so Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. So he's getting ready to launch out again and, and spread the gospel to other cities. But there in that area, there's lots of Jews in that area, and he wants to see them get saved, and lots of Gentiles, and Paul wants to see them get saved. And so he wants Timothy to go with. He's a great combination, this guy, right? He's a Jew, and he's a Greek. He's both, right? So now what you've got is you've got a really awesome opportunity to talk to both races, both groups of people. You've got a Jew and you've got a Gentile all wrapped up in this guy, Timothy, who's now a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, in deference to the Jews in the area, he arranged for Timothy to be circumcised before they left, for everyone knew that his father was a Greek. 
Then they went from town to town instructing the believers to follow the decisions made by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. Here's, this is awesome. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and grew larger every day. I'm certainly rejoicing that you guys came out here this morning to, to, to do this together, to, to worship Jesus, to hear from Jesus, to sing his praises and support his kingdom effort and all that. But there are some people that just really despise large churches, and I just don't understand why they would do that when the Bible just commends it right here. So the churches were strengthened in their faith, so that's growing what? Deeper, right? Deeper. And then also what? Larger every day. So deep and wide, deep and wide. That's what God wants. He wants more disciples and better disciples. That's what he's looking for, right? So that's what happens there. So you notice there's a little bit of a difference between what the Pharisees were teaching about circumcision to be saved versus what the Apostle Paul said about circumcision. You know, at the heart of the gospel, we see this. It's others above ourselves, right? Isn't that what we see? Look at Jesus Christ, right? The perfect Son of God, right? He, he, he endures the cross. Why? Why does the one who doesn't deserve to be on the cross go on the cross for you? Because you're important, right? He put you above himself, right? It says that, that he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. That's what he did. That, that, that he who knew no sin, right, he never sinned. He who knew no sin became sin. He didn't just pay the price for your sin. He became murder. He became rape. He became thievery. He became greed. He became sin so that in him, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has died. Behold, the new man. Anyone who's like that, who's in him, can now be the righteousness of God. Right? The, the, the perfect one becomes imperfect, so the perfect ones, raise your hand, can become perfect. That's the gospel. He puts others above himself, right? Philippians chapter 2, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others as well. Have the same attitude as Christ. Others before me, others before me. So what we see here is not you got to be circumcised to be saved. We see Paul arrange for Timothy, who's already a grown young man, right? He's not eight, years, not eight days old anymore. I don't know how old he is, but he's, he's, he's a believer, and he wants him to come with him to help preach. And he becomes the, 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 a pastor. He's a grown man now. He's young, but he's a grown man. And he arranges for Timothy, who was already a Christian, to be circumcised. Now listen, not to be saved, but to be effective, right? That's why he did it, because the people that they were going to go out and meet were so important to Timothy and so important to Paul and ultimately so important to Jesus and wanted them to be saved so bad that this Timothy would forego this suffering and sacrifice of being circumcised. Everyone should go, whoop! To be circumcised as an adult. Why? So that he could have an audience and he could be an effective communicator of the gospel so people would listen and receive it and be saved. That's why he did it. Why did he do it? In deference to the Jews. That's what it said, right? What's deference mean? Humble submission and respect. I care about them. I'll do whatever it takes to see them get saved. That's what I'll do. Will you do that? I'm not asking you to get circumcised now. I'm asking you, will you do whatever it takes? Do you know that it's that important? Do other people matter that much to you? And does what Jesus commissioned you to do matter enough that you will suffer and sacrifice so that other people would get saved? That's the question at hand. That's all that matters. Why did Timothy do this? To create an audience. The, listen, I'm Jewish, and I'm telling you right now that Jewish people, I think Carl will probably tell you this too, because he kind of researches this kind of stuff. Jewish people don't listen to the Gentiles. Do you understand? They don't listen to you. You can tell them about Jesus all day long, hanging from a chandelier and doing cartwheels, okay, with candy apples popping out of your mouth. They're not going to listen to you, right? They have thousands and thousands of years of ingrained religiosity. They're not going to listen to you. They think you're crazy. But they'll listen to a Jew. They'll listen to a Jew. Maybe they'll listen to a Jew. They're that stubborn. Maybe they'll listen to a Jew 
who has found Jesus and had their life turned around. And maybe they'll listen to him. And so here's this kid, who, and you know, back then it was not about mom. Moms didn't really matter that much. Happy Mama's Day to all of you mommies out there, right? Awesome, right? Yes, amen. But listen, I totally lost my train of thought. Moms didn't matter back then. Ladies didn't, ladies didn't have the, 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 the status that they are held in now. So you were identified by your dad, right? Dad's a Greek, right? So Timothy, in deference to the Jews, because he wants to see them get saved, he now identifies himself as a Jew to create an audience of, from Jewish people. That's awesome, right? Willing to do that? We're, in, in a few minutes, we're going to have an offering plate, right? An offering plate. Just think about this. An offering plate where, where Jesus is going to say, hey, what did I give you? What will you give back so I could use it to advance my kingdom? Now, this is kind of funny and silly, but how many people are going to drop their foreskin in that thing? No, I'm just serious. Right? I'm, I'm just saying a figure of speech, right? How many people are willing to sacrifice like that into the offering plate of the kingdom of God? That's all I'm saying. And we shy away from this thing, but look at what Timothy's doing to advance the kingdom of God. He's willing to have his... Don't need to be graphic. Jews only tend to listen to Jews, and then listen also. Don't, he's going to go not just talk to the Jewish people, right? Now they're starting to invade the Gentile world. Right? And so listen, don't Gentiles need to see that the, he, that the God of the Hebrews will accept one of us? So what does Timothy do? Look it, I'm a Greek, and I'm one of his, right? I'm one of his. This guy created such an amazing audience through his sacrificial suffering, and that's an example for all of us of what a saved person might do to advance effectively the kingdom of God. Did he need to do this? No. no. But did he need to do this? Yes, right? Because it, the kingdom of God was the most important thing to him. And I think if we could get one message pounded into the minds of Christian people in this country is that the kingdom of God is the most important thing. Not you, not your job, not your family, not your job, nothing else. The kingdom of God is the most important thing in the world. That's it. And if we would get that into our minds and start to live that thing out, you think this church would still be this empty? Heck no. It would be packed because life change would happen here. And people want that. They just don't know how to get it and they don't know what it is because they don't see it in us. So this is not what we do to get saved by any means. We don't get circumcised to get saved, but it may be what saved people would do, okay? We don't get saved by circumcision. We don't get saved by keeping God's commands, we don't get saved by doing good, although those things are important and we should do them for sure, but that doesn't get you saved, okay? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this, right? You got it in your Bible? Look, at, look in your Bible. Don't just let me read it to you. I want you to see it. There's something about reading it, maybe taking notes like X-Man's doing over there. It kind of ingrains it. Remember we talked about God welded into our mind, right? You know it sticks a lot better when you read it and you write it. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, written by apostles, right? These are the guys who know the gospel, right? God saved you by his grace when you believed. Where's the circumcision part? Say it ain't in there, right? It's not like prego. It's in there. It's not in there. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for that. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good that you've done. Maybe you've done some good. Maybe you deserve an attaboy. Maybe one day Jesus will say, hey, well done and good and faithful service. A servant, that's awesome. But those things that you did didn't get you in front of him for heaven, right? He did. He did. He says, not, it's not a reward for the good that you've done, so nobody can boast. In other words, nobody can say, hey, because I did this, because I gave this much, because I did this, because I helped, because I was this, or because I was that. Look how awesome I am. Jesus let me in. That's not the way it is. Nobody can boast. There's not a single, the Bible says that no one is good. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is seeking God. No one, right? How many people does that, does that include? Everybody. There's no one that's good. I don't, you know some nice folks? Yeah, that's not good enough, Right? 
You know some nice folks? Not good enough. You know some nice folks? Not good enough. No one's good enough to get in. Does he like it when we're good? Absolutely, right? We're parents. I'm a parent. I like it when my kids do good. But that's not why I love them. I just love them because I love them, right? Even if they're rotten, and they are, but I still love them. Look, he says, it's not a reward for the good that you've done, so nobody can boast. We are God's masterpiece, right? So we didn't create how awesome we were. We didn't create the status that we now have as a co-heir with Christ to the glory of God, getting to be in heaven with him, right? We're God's masterpiece. You didn't make how awesome you are. He made how awesome you are, right? You're his masterpiece. Now, this is, this is the part that's really, you know, we, have, we pray, oh, yeah, Jesus did this. Here's the part that, that you're in part of, and you might not like this part, but it's part of the word of God, so it's important. So we're God's masterpiece, created anew in Christ. We still get amens there? Amen. For good works. Yes. For good works. Yeah, okay. Mufasa, say it again. Right. <laughs> Only the... Kid, only the people with kids know that one. <laughs> Created anew in Christ for good works. I just want to know, I want you to know something. Like when you study the Bible, you're supposed to stop and study. Don't just read it. Is it good work or works? Ks, 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 ks. Plural, right? Plural, plural. Just keep that in mind, right? Not saved because you did something but now saved so you can do some things, Hello. right? Saved so you could do some things. Why are, you, why are you breathing right now? To do some things, right? To do some things. Have you been saved? Yeah. Have you been saved? Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned to God through Jesus Christ the Lord and bent the knee to his lordship by faith, yeah. right? If so, what are you doing? What kind of... Works. What do we mean by what are you doing? What works? Um, Matthew 5.16 might help you with that. Let your good deeds, plural, 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 right? Let your good deeds. Hey, you know, back in 1982, I gave this car up to this family. Awesome. Cookie. What else? Where, where's your good deeds? Right? Your good works. Deeds. Let your good deeds shine. Why? So you can boast. For all to see, so that everyone will praise your Father. Amen. So when it says you've been saved for good works, it means works that advance the kingdom of God, right? That's why you do it. Why did Jesus perform a, a miracle for these people who were sick and dying and all that? Did he do it to be nice to them? Well, certainly, yes. But what else? To advance the kingdom, get their face off of their problem and off of the world and up to the Father. That's what he would do it for. That's the only reason why he performed miracles. And that's why we do good works. Not just being nice. All of us should be nice. Atheists should be nice and are nice sometimes. But we do good works that are intentional and purposeful to get people away from everything else and get their eyes on Jesus. That's the kind of good works you've been created to do. So I ask you now afresh, what are you doing what are you doing to advance the kingdom of God? We worship Christ. We walk with Christ. Right? We walk with Christ. That means we, 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 his spirit is with us. We're, we're listening to the word. We're reading the word. We're acknowledging the word. We're living out the word. Right? We're praying to him daily. We're doing those things. We're interacting with him. He's with us. He's with us. He's with us. I get that. So we're worshiping him. That's what we're here to do today. We're walking with him. But then we not just wor worship Christ and walk with Christ, but we work with Christ. You know, I was going to write, we work for Christ. That's what I had in my notes originally, but I had to scratch it out, and, and I recognized something. That's wrong. We don't work for Christ. We work with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.9, God is faithful to do what he says. Someone say, Amen. thank you. And he has invited you, this is awesome, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. That's crazy, right? Partners with the creator of the universe. 
I would love to be partners with the, with the richest guy who owns a company. Like, that would be awesome. I'd like to be partners with, with, with someone that's successful, right? I'm happy that I'm partners with my wife in this thing called life. But I get to be partners with Jesus, right? That's crazy, right? So listen, if you study and you pray, and if you're here, like right now, then you got the worship and the walking thing going on. That's kind of cool. But what about work with? Isolate yourself for a second, right? He's talking to you. What about work with? How many Bible studies do you need to go to? How much praying do you need to do before you get off your hiney and do something to advance the kingdom of God that you are praising? Right? There's a lot of people that do that. that They sit around, they pray, and we do this, and we can read, and we can study, and praise Jesus, and sit at home, and we worship him with music, and you should do that. But at some point, you're created anew in Christ Jesus for good works, to do something to advance his kingdom, right? We're saved to advance the kingdom. So listen, if you're saved for good works, and you can hear my voice, don't leave here today without a specific. Don't leave. Don't waste this time and go, hey, that was a good message, man. I don't care if you like it or not. I want to be effective. And a, and a pastor who's effective has a church that's engaged in the work of the kingdom. That's it. it, it I had a thousand people in this room, and all of you thought that was the best message I ever heard and did nothing about it. I'm an epic failure here. This church should close. You can't leave here today if God's speaking to you and you feel like he's tugging at your heart. You can't leave here today without a specific on what to do. How can I serve? Who can I invite? How can I grow? What thing, how can I increase my generosity? What things in my life can I alter and change so that I can be more generous? Who can I disciple? Right? Who can I call upon to disciple me so I can be that guy or that girl? Who can I forgive today? What am I doing? Right? What am I doing? Be be, live life on purpose, right? Wake, when you leave, like before you leave, like now, what are you going to do different? If you leave this room right now and you don't plan to do something different, I'm not talking about something like just for you and him. I'm talking about created for good works to advance the kingdom. What are you doing to advance his kingdom? You Listen, pray, sing, study, Awesome. What are you doing so others can get into the kingdom that you're in? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Yeah. So I want to, I'm, I'm never going to be satisfied with just like preaching some truth. Truth has to, has to become action or it's a failure. It's a failure. Okay. So what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? So the book of Acts is just simply the story of advancing the kingdom, right, by making disciples. That's what they did, right? Over and over and over again, what they do? They preach, people believe, then you're going to see they appoint elders to oversee those churches that they planted, then they go on to the next place, and they preach, and they make disciples, and they get baptized, and they start a church, and then they go to the next city, and they preach, and they make disciples, and they get baptized, and they start a church. Over and over and over again, the book of Acts is simply this. We're making disciples, we're advancing the kingdom of God. And so James stands up, if you go back to our text in Acts chapter 15, verse 19, first, there's a, there's a Peter stands up and they, he preaches, <laughs> telling him all these things, and then Paul and Barnabas stood up and they preach, and then James stands up, and he says in verse 19, and so my judgment is, as we're making disciples, is that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't make it difficult, right? Don't add something to the gospel. Don't add something to the gospel, because this gospel at its foundation is something that you can't boast about, right? It had nothing to do with what you do. 
That's what he said in Ephesians, right? It's a gift of God so that no man can boast. It's not a reward for anything you would do. You were, you were saved by grace. Amen. You see it reiterated again. Look at verse 8 through 11. Look at what Peter says. God knows people's hearts and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. You remember Pentecost, Acts chapter 2? The Jews are all hanging out and God loves them and he saves them and he gives them the Holy Spirit. And he says here that God did the same thing to the Gentiles. So does he see a dip? Do you have to become Jewish to become a Christ follower, right? He says, no, you don't need to. I'll give you my Holy Spirit just like I gave the circumcised guys. You don't need to be circumcised. I'll give it to you just the same. And there's evidence that that has happened. And so he gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit just as he did. He made no distinction between us and them. Amen. Amen. You see how God has a huge congregation it's all the people on earth, Jew and Gentile alike, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, they will bow. As he says, he made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their heart through faith, just like he did to the Jewish people. Nothing's different. So why are you now challenging God? Don't do that. Why are they now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. Do you notice here something? I just noticed this too. Do you notice this is kind of like a Paul moment? Remember when Paul gets saved? Why are you persecuting me? He wasn't persecuting Jesus in a sense, was he? He was persecuting people. But Jesus is that close to his people. Amen. You mess with my wife, you mess with me. You see? And so what, what's going on here? Look at the same kind of a language right here. He says... You're challenging God by burdening his people. Don't mess with my people, right? Don't mess with my people. Because he's that close and his love for his bride is that powerful. And now watch. Here we go. Here's the gospel. You ready? We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Done. Amen. Amen. That's the gospel. So now, when I first got started, I said that this kind of false teaching, maybe not unintentional, happens in churches today too, right? So I want to share some of those things with you. And this is not, this may, some of you might take this wrong, but I never want your feelings to trump truth. In this church, you're going to get truth, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I'm trying to soften up here, Mike, you know? I feel you, but I do care about your feelings, but not as much as I care about the truth, okay? And I want you, listen, can we just endeavor to let our feelings be shaped by the truth rather than other stuff that doesn't matter, right? We're all like that. I get that too. So what are some things you might hear in today's churches that are added to salvation? An unfair burden, right? Making it difficult. How are we challenging God? Well, here's the first one. The first one is a Catholic thing. Okay, and I, when I mention some of these groups, I'm not telling you that there's no such thing as a Catholic who is saved. I mean, there, there's probably tons of Catholics that have put their faith in Christ and Christ alone. And even though some of the church things are taught that are not biblical, um, as you know, there's people in our church that aren't doing everything right, too, because they're not studiers. So they don't know. So a lot of the things that are done in churches are done in ignorance. But let's just talk about what's taught, right? Not maybe what's practiced in the church. Because like here, like, I believe that we teach the truth here, but that doesn't mean all of us are living the truth here all the time. When somebody comes in and says, what do you believe? I say, I don't know. Come on Sunday morning and ask those people. I can tell you what I believe, but I'm not the church. They are, right? I'm just one part of it. So everybody's different. So I'm not going to say that, that Roman Catholics are all unsaved because I, I, I couldn't dear do that. It says in the scripture we just read that God knew their hearts, right? He knows hearts. I, I, I don't know hearts. And so I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to learn my own. I'm trying to learn my wife's. And that's, if I could accomplish that, I'd be batting a thousand. I don't know everybody's. But what are some things that um, some churches do? So here's a Catholic thing, and it's this, that you've got to be right with the church to be saved. Okay? That's what they would say. Now, where am I getting that? Again, not everyone in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church might agree with this or practice this, but this is taught in Roman Catholicism. They have a core beliefs thing called their catechism, right? 
So Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 846, this is what it says, okay? All salvation comes from Christ the head. Can we pause there and give that an amen? amen? We all agree with that, right? All salvation comes from Christ the head. So Christ is the head of the church, Colossians chapter 1. All salvation comes from him. Ephesians, we just read it, right? So they're tracking right there. But here it starts to turn. All salvation comes from Christ the head through the church, which is his body. Oops. Boo-boo. Basing itself on scripture and tradition. Oops, right? Oops. How many people have some traditions in their families, right? Does that mean they're biblical? Put your hand out, right? No, of course not. Are they nice? Okay, but to treat them as, as lofty as God's word, so we have to do it? Oops, right? So basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Oops. The one Christ is the mediator and the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. Bit of an oops there, really. Where is he present? In the Holy Spirit, right? And in the church, because we have the Holy Spirit in us. That's the only reason why Jesus is here. It's not because of y'all, right? It's because of the Holy Spirit in you. Oops. The one Christ is the mediator in the way of salvation. He is present to us in his body, which is the church. He himself explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism. I would agree with that. I get that, but then watch this. And thereby affirmed, because, listen, because he explicitly asserted the necessity of faith and baptism, their tradition would say, and thereby affirmed, thereby affirmed, although never said, thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church. Amen. Is church good? Are we part of it? Do we have a job to do? Yeah. Right? But it never said, he never said you need the church to get saved. He didn't say it. He just didn't say it. Okay? So he says this. He says, thereby affirmed at the same time the necessity of the church, which men enter through baptism as through a door. Hence they could not be saved, who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, first of all, <laughs> let me just tell you something, with love, you ain't necessary. Do you understand? Guess what? If no one in this room was ever born, Jesus Christ is Lord. Okay? So let's just get that straight right here, okay? So, hence, they could not be saved who, knowing that the Catholic Church was founded as necessary by God through Christ, would refuse either to enter it or to remain in it. So if you don't enter the Catholic Church and you don't stay in the Catholic Church, guess what? You ain't saved. Eh. That's the first one. So they just, like, okay, listen. Do I, I don't need a response here, no editorials, but do I think that the Roman Catholic Church is intentionally wicked? I don't know the Pope from the Pope, <laughs> right? But do I, so I, I can't say, and I can't say all these people that, that wrote the catechism all these thousands, I, I can't say. Might they be good intentioned people who actually believe this? Possibly, I don't know. But are they adding something to the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified? Yeah. Yes, they're saying that you need to be part in good standing with the Roman Catholic Church to be saved, and you need to stay in it to be saved. What is that telling you? It's telling us that if we leave this, the Roman Catholic Church and go to a, here, Southern Baptist Church, Assembly of God Church, whatever, that you're not saved. That's what they would say. Yeah, that's what they would say. Yeah. <clears throat> I love you so much. You I don't love you have too. to study this. <laughs> Here's the next one. This is something that you'd hear from the United Pentecostal Church International. They have, of course, the United Pentecostal Church of America as part of their organization. Um, I know some people in that church. I love some of those people in that church that I know. I mean, like, dear, one of my best friends, okay? And I, and I don't think that he... I don't think that he's not saved. I think that he's absolutely saved. And I know the pastor of the local church of that denomination. 
And do I think that he's saved? Absolutely. He's a beautiful man. But here's what they would teach you, and that is that speaking in tongues is a necessary element of salvation. Okay? And, and you may have heard this before. You've got to speak in tongues. You've got to speak in tongues to be saved. Okay? I want to turn your attention, if you will, because my opinion doesn't mean anything. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Why don't you just take a quick peek over there? You can keep your finger in, in Acts 15 and 16, but look at uh, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And what we see here is the Apostle Paul, who absolutely we can all agree that he knows the gospel, right? He knows what he's talking about. And he starts listing some of the gifts into the body of Christ. Okay, apostles, prophets, teachers, those who do miracles, gift of healing, helps, leadership, and then unknown languages. In the New Living Translation, they, they make it unknown languages because the word tongues would be misunderstood by people. Right? What is that? What is that? Okay, it's tongues. You can look it up. If you read a King James or something, you'll see tongues. Okay? So then here's the question he asks. And they're rhetorical questions. What are rhetorical questions? Questions that have an obvious answer. You're asking them kind of almost in a silly way to make a point, right? He says this. Are we all apostles? Can we all, can we all say this? Are we all apostles? Okay, we're not all apostles. Are we all, should we all be sort of apostolic in advancing the kingdom? Yes, but we're not all apostles, right? How many people here in this room were walking with Jesus when he did this stuff? All right, exactly. Okay. Are we all apostles? We all know this. No. Are we all prophets? No. Can we be prophetic? Can, we, can, I, can I share with you the, a, a, a good prophecy? Can I share with you what I think the Lord is saying to me to give you? Like, I can do that, but am I a prophet? Like the ones who wrote some of this stuff? I'm not that guy, right? None of us are that guy. I'm not writing a book of the Bible. So it's like an obvious no. Are we all apostles? No. Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? No. But we can be. Right? We should be teaching some people. We should be discipling some people. Do we all have power to do miracles? No, not all the time. Can God, can, can, can God empower you from upon high in a moment to do something? You were like, how did that happen? Whoa, right? Could that happen? He's the God of the universe, right? He said, step into the Jordan, and they did. They never opened up a river before. It was amazing, right? And they went like this. As soon as they went in with the ark, boom, the water stopped. Like, how does that happen? Because he can do that. But, but do we all have the power like the apostles did? Hey, stand up and walk. Not everybody can do that, right? That'd be awesome if we could do that. And maybe you could do that at a time, but not everybody just does that all the time like these guys were doing in the Bible. He says, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret tongues? What's it say? Of course not, my Bible says. Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Desire these gifts. But do you have them? Not everybody can, right? So, so to say that, you, that, that speaking in tongues is a necessary element of salvation is bad teaching because not everyone in the body of Christ will speak in tongues. So what happens to the man or the woman who loves Jesus, admits their sinful problem and they can't get better, and they bow down before Jesus Christ the Lord and accept him as Savior and Messiah and all that, right? And they don't speak in tongues. What happens? I'll tell you what happens. They're saved. They're saved, right? And then maybe God from upon high can deposit that gift, boom, into you. And all of a sudden, here he goes with his tongues. But what if he doesn't do that for Jerome? Does that mean somehow he's not saved? See, this is taught, and this is adding something to the simplicity of the gospel, okay? We don't want that. We don't want that. <clears throat> Here's the third one. You might get it in churches today. Again, I'm not ripping certain churches. I think that they have good intention. They may see it in Scripture differently, but I'm just going to let the Word of God speak to you, and you can make this decision yourself. But there's folks in what's called the Christian church. It's part of a restoration movement. There's churches of the Christian church. They don't call themselves a denomination, but a brotherhood. That's a nice disguise. Um, but they teach that you have to be baptized to be saved. Okay, so can we just do, 
Do me a favor. Can we just go back to Acts chapter 15 where we just were? What's verse 11 say? Just, I want you to just read it. Look at your Bible. 15.11. We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And so to teach that baptism cleans you and removes your sin, to teach that baptism pardons you, is to teach that Jesus does not. Okay? John 1.29 says, Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. 1 John 2.2 2 says this, He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself, say himself, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sin, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. Amen. Listen, Jesus Christ alone saves. Do you understand? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Okay? The church doesn't save. Tongues don't save. And baptism doesn't save. And listen, circumcision ain't going to cut it. Get it? I, 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 I battled with that one all day. Like, am I going to say that? But you know me. Of course I'm going to say that. All by myself. Well, I, thought, I like to think that I'm inspired of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Amen. Since we live by the Spirit, let the Spirit control all parts of our life. So yeah. Yeah. just saying, circumcision won't cut it. So listen, responding to what Jesus taught, what he said, what he did, all of that is mandatory, okay? It's mandatory. But also, we must never compromise the gospel in order to advance it. Hello. Never, 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 never. Because we don't want to advance a false gospel that doesn't save people, that doesn't advance that kingdom, okay? We don't want to advance anything else. So not only must we respond, that means we I stress in this this morning. We do something. Amen. You do something. You get off your hiding and you start doing something to advance the kingdom of God. You are saved for good works. Amen. But we must also respond correctly, right? He said, go make disciples, right? Go make disciples of all people, of all nations, right? That's a big, tall order, but that's what he's called us to do. So we have to go do that. We've got to do something. But when we go make disciples, we've got to make proper disciples, right? We've got to teach them the right things. We have to be careful what we're multiplying. We have to be careful what we're reproducing. What, are you, what, are you, what disciples are you making here? And for that reason, we never compromise to make salvation easy or palatable. And we never, ever, on the flip side of that, we never, ever add anything to the gospel, Amen. ever add anything to it. We never add a yoke of unneeded weight we never make it more difficult to be saved. Jesus saves. And he did it already on the cross. One of those verses I read to you said that not only did he die for our sin, but he died for everyone's sin. So listen. You don't actually like get saved the moment you say yes. Do you understand that you got saved when he did that? Yes. He did it already. Okay, that was your salvation. Done. The moment it's credited to your account is when you bow your knee. Amen. But you got saved 2,000 years ago. That's right. right? You that's did. Right. And you just have to now say yes to it that's already been done. <clears throat> the sinless, perfect Son of God. Jesus Christ, who is himself God, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily in Jesus Christ, descends from heaven, goes to a cross to pay for the penalty of your sin and the sin of all people. And if you genuinely repent of your sin, your part, what you did to put him up there, that Jesus paid for and became, 
and choose to honor Jesus alone as your Lord, Messiah, and King, then his cross work becomes your cross work, and you're saved because of that and that alone, and that is it. Nothing more, nothing less. That alone gets people into the kingdom. Do you want that? That's the only thing that matters. Do you want that? But now being that you are in the kingdom of God, it means that you are saved to do good works so that more can get in. So I close with this. Here at Revolution Church, we are dedicated to making disciples of Jesus Christ by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here it is again, and I want to say this again, not only to honor you and honor the Lord, but I want to say this as if Jay was going to be up here right now, because I know him. He's a gospel freak. His favorite song was Jesus Freak. We're going to play that at his funeral when we, get, when we have one. We're playing Jesus Freak at his funeral. Here it is. You ready? Here's the gospel. You're a sinner, and Jesus is not. And he dies in your place to pay your penalty. You believe this, and he receives you, period. That's the gospel. It's that simple. But never, listen, Jesus Christ and me and Herb and this church and all of us here, never content to leave you right there. Always pushing, always pushing, always pushing, always encouraging, always hammering you all the time because we're saved for works to advance the kingdom. So I ask you again now, what are you doing? What are you doing to advance the kingdom? We worship Christ. We walk with Christ. And we work with Christ. Not going to have a circumcision party here this afternoon. But how are you going to start putting the lost above yourself how are you going to start considering others above yourselves and have the same attitude as Christ who endured the cross so that you could have the kingdom how are you going to endure the suffering of Timothy and the sacrifice of Timothy and Paul and all those that went before you in this book that we study how will you be like them by sacrificing and suffering and I don't want to say just a little A lot. So that others might receive the kingdom that God has so graciously given you. Let's talk to God about that. Because you're probably all thinking, you know, I I do want to do something here. And I don't know what to do. So why don't we, um, why don't you kill these lights? I don't want anyone looking at me. Let's talk to the Lord about that. Father, um, I want to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because I don't know. <laughs> We've had some conversations around here lately about the Trinity and it's a bit of a mystery to us, Lord. So we just say Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the fullness of God. Whoever you are, whatever you are, we acknowledge that we're not <laughs> and that you are. We understand that your word is true and you've spoken to us this morning about it, but our need to worship you and walk with you and to work with you and challenging us to do some things. And although the flawed messenger has said, what will you do? And we want to do something, but we don't know exactly what to do. So we want our day to be a a day that advances your kingdom. You said deep and wide, deep and wide, right? The church grew in faith and in number. Well, the faith came first in that verse, and then it grew larger. So here we are, your disciples, desiring to grow deeper so that your church could grow larger. What is it that you want, make it personal, that you want me to do that others may have the kingdom that you've so graciously given me? Speak, Lord.